Thanks, everyone. Totally conscious that following Brian Cantrell is a hard act, yeah? That, that talk was awesome. The one good thing is I don't have to apologize for talking too fast, which I usually do. So Brian's kind of set me up there, which is great. The next 15 minutes, we're going to look at the seven more deadly sins of microservices, the kind of anti-patterns, effectively, that I see and have seen over the past three or so years as a consultant, working in the UK uh, and in Germany and a little bit in the US as well. It started a few years ago. I, I did an initial seven deadly sins um, at, I think it was DevOps UK and QCon New York. And these were kind of the deadly sins related to anti-patterns of microservices. Uh, got some traction, got some great feedback. I learned a bunch from presenting. One of the reasons I like to present is to get feedback from yourself. So please, you know, rate the app, rate via the app, obviously, but come and chat to me afterwards as well. This talk is now online, if you go onto InfoQ, and actually the talk I'm doing now is on InfoQ as well, a slightly older version every time it changes. But these are the new deadly sins, yeah? There's definitely a bit of crossover from the original deadly sins, the original anti-patterns, but we'll go through today and have a look. I'm not gonna say these are more advanced, they're just a bit different. I noticed as microservices sort of moved into the mainstream, I was working with different companies, sort of moved from the innovators to the early majority, if you're familiar with diffusion of innovation, uh, and different problems came up. Those companies have different skill sets, different goals, different values, and all these kind of things. So I've tried to reflect that in the latest version of the talk. So this is me, love getting involved on the Twitters, at Daniel Bryant UK, the UK at the end is important. I think the other guy, like without the uh, UK is a wrestler or something, so don't tweet at them, tweet at me. Uh, as Sam mentioned, software developer, um, been Java developer for a long time, Go, JavaScript as well. Big fan of continuous delivery. So I've got a book, a mini book out on O'Reilly. You can grab a free copy, thanks to Nginx, via that link there. And I might have a couple of hard copies, actually, to give away at the end as well. Um, but I'm a big fan of continuous delivery and technology and teams. You know, definitely the, the, the symbiosis of the two things is super, super important. And microservices, I think, bring this to the forefront. Brian sort of hinted at that in terms of microservices being quite tricky from an organizational side. Let's dive straight in, yeah, the first anti-pattern, and it's lust, and it's using the latest and greatest technologies. We're all guilty of that, yeah. The reason you're at a conference is probably to learn about the latest and greatest tech. The challenge is, new technology is great until it isn't, yeah. And the, you know, I'm a developer, this has been me many times, yeah. Uh, you know, Go, Docker, Kubernetes, all these good things. Um, it's very easy to trip ourselves up, yeah. Evaluation is a critical skill. Seems obvious, but I've come to realize in my career that kind of obvious things and common sense is anything but common. It's good to be reminded of these things. My mentors remind me constantly about the need to evaluate. As I've moved sort of from a dev to an architect to a CTO, evaluation changes how you do it and what your goals are, but evaluation is super, super critical, yeah? Thinking about are microservices even a good fit? And I like to look at a lot of things from the perspective of business, organizational stuff, from architecture and the operational side as well, DevOpsy stuff. I like to, I'm seeing a bit of this. Gartner talk about mode two, sort of the forward facing apps. They should be now agile and nimble, which is great. They should be microservices. The challenge is I'm seeing the sort of middle management latching onto a buzzword and saying they're doing microservices even when they're not, yeah? And this has issues with app evolution being limited by the existing system. They redo some of their middleware as microservices, all these kind of things. The problem with both of these kind of things is it's effectively lipstick on the pig, yeah? Looks good at first glance, go a little deeper, not so great. From an architectural point of view, I think it's really critical to build around business functionality. Uh, Eberhard Wolf talks a lot about, and, and Stefan Tilkov as well, about self-contained systems. And I like a lot of the self-contained systems are kind of like microservices plus plus. I'm not saying one's better than the other, but they're a bit more restrictive in their design principles. So I really like this notion, both from microservices and self-contained systems, of building around business functionality. This is where I and my team and the companies I've worked with have had the most success. We're not simply reinventing middleware, we're building business, you know, slices of business functionality. 
You've got to be aware of things like cloud native as well. I, I kind of hate the word cloud native, but like DevOps and like a bunch of other things, you know, it's quite an open term, but there is some value in it, yeah? Being cloud native thinks about how the underlying infrastructure has changed over the years. And therefore, now we need to think about things like architecting for 12 factors or 15 factors. There's another, um, another great book on O'Reilly about 15 factors. We really need to understand the architectural principles behind microservices. Yeah? Now, microservices emerged from the likes of Netflix, Amazon, Gilt, and they emerged a lot, lot of times out of the organizational structure. Now, many of us are kind of copying it the other way around. So we really need to think about architectural principles. Finally, DevOps. DevOps, um, as, you know, as Brian hinted out in a bunch of great talks I've seen yesterday, DevOps is many things to many people. For me, it's kind of end-to-end -end responsibility of, of delivery uh, and continuing support. But in my journey, I've seen DevOps be everything from sort of on a spectrum, if you like, from developer with root access to production, seen that one a few times, yeah? Right the way through to massive change control. There's probably a happy medium there somewhere, yeah? So we need to think about these things. Are we as a company, are we as an organization, are we as a team good from the business point of view? Are we good from the sort of architectural point of view? And do we get the ops side as well? These are critical things to think about. If you're moving to um, microservices, serverless, nano services, take your pick. These are the things I think we need to think about. Once you've decided to move to an architectural style, because that's pretty much what microservices are, you need to think about technology that comes along with it. More often than not, you don't even need to change your technology. It's kind of tempting, and I'll talk about that in a second, but I've seen many great systems you know, built on PHP, built on Python, built on Java, and they've literally used the same kind of stack just to build smaller, well-defined services. And that has worked really well. I've seen many other organizations, and of course, this is all anecdotal based on my experience and massive survivor bias and all this kind of thing, but I've seen many other organizations where they've said be a PHP shop, and they try to build Java microservices, or they're a Java shop, and they try to build Go-based microservices. Sometimes that's valid, but sometimes it's not. We need to think, when we're going to bring in new tech to the stack, we need to have effective conversations about why we're bringing these things in. And this is one of my favorite models. It's not mine. I've, I've got it from a conference a couple of years ago, an Agile conference, I think over in, in the US, actually. And it talked about the spine model. Now, we as, as humans are really good at using tools. Yeah? It's what separates us from kind of our nearest you know, evolutionary competitors. But as sort of tooling has got more specific, and in our world, I'm talking about you know, Java, Go, um, Kubernetes, ECS, that kind of thing. As tooling's got more specific, we often get stuck where equally plausible options are available, but we don't know how to resolve any differences. The classic I see, for example, is I like Java, I like Go. And people just get stuck at the tool level at the bottom. But they need to work up the spine, and there's a whole wiki that explains how to do it, to look at what are we really valuing. Yeah? Now, as a team, we might value a really strong, strong tool chain. Now, I think Java, at the moment, is getting a stronger tool chain than Go, personal opinion. If we're developing for lightweight container-based services, and we're being charged for RAM and you know, footprint, then Go is probably a better solution. But we need to be having the right conversation at the right level of the spine. And these things, it just helps me as a developer. When I'm you know, getting really in the details, it helps me have the conversations with my team lead, with my CTO or whatever. Make sure I'm having the right conversation at the right level. I found this really beneficial. Definitely have a look at the wiki. Little bit of an example, yeah, so to sort of bring some of these things home. The classic with microservices I'm seeing is should we containerize or not, yeah? Docker, docker, docker kind of thing. Now, I love Docker. I've used Docker many times. Uh, sometimes it's not appropriate, though, but this might kind of bring a few things home. I think from a strategic point of view, we're seeing this kind of thing, and, and a hat tip to Casey West here on this stuff. This is Casey's slide. And he talks about we crammed this monolith into a container and called it a microservice. Now, this is lipstick on the pig, pretty much, yeah. Architecture ops, same kind of thing. From, you know, expectations versus reality. Containers just look amazing. Yeah, anyone who saw Andrew, uh, Andrew Clay Schaefer's talk yesterday talks about this. It's great, you know, we can just put our application in the containers, it's all, all, all good stuff, yeah? But the reality is, yeah, this is containers, but if your architecture or your operational practices are a bit of a tire fire, all you end up with is tire fire in a container, yeah? And I'm sure a few of you can see at the bottom of the first responders here, this is what we refer to as DevOps in our industry, yeah? <laughs> Continually putting out fires, yeah? I've been there, I'm sure you have as well. In terms of evaluation, be careful what you search for. If you search for 
I should use Docker in production, you'll get a thousand articles that say yes. If you search for I should not use Docker in production, you'll get a thousand articles that say no. So confirmation bias is really um, quite tricky. The original Deadly Sins talk talks about how to overcome this a bit more. But I just want to do, you know, it's, it's early morning, I kind of want to get people sort of engaged, very small amount of audience participation. It is super easy to be tricked in terms of bias. So I'm gonna ask you, who thinks the top line's bigger or the bottom line's bigger or they're both the same size? So who thinks the top line's bigger there? Got a few, cool. Who thinks the bottom line is bigger? And who thinks they're both the same size? So the vast majority of they're both the same size. It's actually the top line that is bigger, yeah? <laughs> I've tricked you. So this, for those who don't know, this is a classic optical illusion, and your brain pattern matched and went, ah, he's trying to be clever. And then I was, but in a subtly different way. Yeah? This happens all the time in tech. You know, even our own kind of um, sensibilities, but definitely when vendors are involved, it's, it's easy to be tricked here. Yeah? So just think. Now, and I don't say this lightly. Um, I read this book, Thinking Fast and Slow, by Daniel Kahneman. I read it about five, ten years ago now, and it genuinely changed my life. Not my develop, just my development life, my life in general. It talks a lot about bias we have as humans, like availability bias, like confirmation bias, these kind of things. And it talks about the heuristics we use. Because our brain is a complex, you know, we haven't, as a, as a species, we haven't figured out our brain yet. You've got the kind of reptilian brain still there from evolutionary time. You've got the neocortex, which is the newer kind of bit of the brain. And, and the book talks about system one and system two, the reptile brain and the sort of thinking brain. It's a really good read. It really helped me understand, obviously not eliminate my bias, because that would be impossible, but it helped me understand some of the bias I bring to the table and some of my team I've, I've seen in the past when we're trying to evaluate, should we move to microservices? Should we use Docker? Those kind of things, yeah? So second sin, gluttony, and this is all about communication lock-in. So a lot of people, in my experience, are a bit shy of using RPC. And if you're a Java developer, uh, I remember I used RMI back in the day, back in sort of 2000s. I don't know if anyone's used RMI, but it was kind of horrible. So I think that's why many of us, and, and there's many other languages have similar stories. So I think that's many of us are a bit shy to use kind of RPC tooling. We like REST and JSON, and, and, and I do, to be honest. REST and JSON is really good. Really good to get started if you're looking at building loosely coupled services, yeah? But don't rule out things like gRPC, um, Apache Thrift, and Avro. They're proper interface definition languages where you specify a contract, and then you, the information goes over the wire in binary format. So it's super efficient because you're sending binary data over the wire, and I like the contract. Sometimes the contract is really beneficial when you're trying to exchange data, yeah? Some of the pushback I get is, you know, the human readability of JSON. But in reality, when systems are in production, you're not going to be reading the traffic going between services. You should be logging correctly what you want to pick out. You should be using correlation IDs and monitoring to understand traces. You shouldn't be relying on the ability to crank open the, the protocols. Kind of a bit uh, conflicting with what Brian said there, totally conscious of that. So I think may, him, him, he and I agree on a whole bunch of stuff, but maybe that one's a slightly um, different thing. But I really like these kind of frameworks. Like they, the gRPC in particular I've used quite a bit. They're, you can generate sort of client stubs and so forth in many different languages. Java, JavaScript, Ruby's a bit wonky actually at the moment, but a bunch of other things. So you can do the whole polyglot thing if you want to, and you can still use these kind of protocols for communicating between services. I got a bit of pushback for a while about the kind of operability of those things. And now what we're seeing is something called service meshes popping up. So it can be quite tricky to do observability and so forth of um, binary protocols. It can be quite tricky. It can be quite tricky to do fault tolerance, uh, routing, service discovery, that kind of thing. So things like Linkerd, Traffic, and Envoy have popped up. Now Linkerd uh, is Scala, JVM based. Uh, Envoy is C++, and Traffic is Go. So everyone's just gone, every community's popped up with this service mesh idea. And the idea being it runs as a sidecar to your main service. Main service here, sidecar pattern's been around for years, and basically your service communicates to the sidecar, and it's then responsible for fault tolerance, uh, for service discovery, for routing, a whole bunch of things, TLS termination, that kind of stuff. 
And I'm really liking this model. I do genuinely think it's where microservice communication, at least the RPC side of microservice communication, will be going over the next few years. Uh, for example, Envoy um, was from Lyft, and you know, Linkerd came out of Buoyant. They're solving really big real-world problems, and a bunch of other problems as well, which many of us can relate to if we don't have massive systems. And, and Christian Poster from Red Hat did a fantastic article introducing the concepts behind service meshes. So you're going to see that, I think, quite a bit over the next couple of years. Totally recommend checking it out. Much as I'm saying RPC, not the devil in disguise, sometimes events are better. And basically, um, events in messaging, you're trading availability for consistency. Now, as a developer, I think this is quite hard sometimes. The kind of um, acid world and the RPC world is much easier to, to model in my head. Uh, that's I, I cut my teeth on relational databases. Or I was a MySQL DBA for a while. And then sort of moving from acid to what they call base now in terms of eventual consistency is quite a mind kind of twist, but it's really beneficial. So as much as I'm saying, look at RPC, look at JSON over REST and stuff, look at RPC, look at events as well. And Jonas Bonnier, I think, is a bit of a head of the curve with this. So uh, Jonas is the CTO at Lightbend, uh, who were TypeSafe, type and he has got some really interesting ideas. So I've linked a presentation, and I wrote up one of his um, talks. So it's all his work there, but I wrote up a talk on InfoQ. I just learned so much about when we should look at events versus RPC. And kind of the reactive thing, and Jonas has been really involved in this, reactive is only getting hotter. Yeah, if you look at a lot of the frameworks, .NET, Java, they're all embracing this reactive principle because I think microservices up until this point have been very much about architecture, the static view of the system, bounded context, et cetera. I think the next evolution, we're seeing it with, say, serverless, is going to be around the data around the events, and this is the dynamic view of the system, yeah? Static and dynamic. There's always the two. As architects, we like to focus on the static, but the dynamic is super important, and reactive kind of embraces that dynamic principle a lot more. Switching it up a little bit. So has anyone worked on enterprise service buses here? I'm conscious I'm a little bit old. Yeah, me and Sam, a few people are, yeah, yeah. If you, and you've been in the industry for a while. Enterprise service buses, the, the dream was that you could have this nice bus in the middle of all your services, you know, they, it basically abstracted away all the communication headaches, yeah? As an architect, when I rolled into projects and I saw this kind of architecture diagram, I was always like, uh-oh, this is not good, yeah? They're like, oh, yeah, our architecture, super simple, a few services talking to each other. I knew when I cranked open the ESB, the communication would be a little bit like this, yeah? I knew there'd be some security and probably some governance going on in there as well, yeah? It's never as simple as it seems on the architecture diagram. Now, the ESB is typically deployed behind the firewall. It's deployed you know, as a back-end kind of communication bus. Um, but say we were to move the service boundary, the ingress point, down a little bit and change some of the service names. So now we've got our entry point there on the blue line, and we've got like iOS app, website, et cetera, et cetera, talking to services below. What I'd like you to ask yourself for a second, is that an ESB or is it an API gateway? Have a little think about that one. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not ragging on API gateways. They are an amazing tool for centralizing a lot of cross-cutting concerns, like rate limiting, security. You know, it's nice to have a central point of ingress, something like an Nginx, a Kong, a MuleSoft API gateway. But it's all too easy to let business logic drift into this thing. It's what happened with ESBs. They, they promised to make our lives simpler, but we were just pushing the complexity somewhere else. Yeah. And you're going to hear me a couple times. As much I genuinely do love um, the Netflix tech stack, I know many of the Netflix people. They're really cool people. Um, what you hear talked about Netflix is a little bit behind where they actually are, in my experience. So you kind of get the echoes of where they've been. And things like Netflix Zool is an amazing API gateway. I'm sure a few of you might be playing around with it. It's like an API gateway. It's pluggable. You can um, put in groovy scripts to dynamically change runtime behavior, which from Netflix's point of view is fantastic. They built out all their backends and they dropped the Groovy script in to enable, like a kind of like a feature flag, like Sam was talking about yesterday, enable that path. The snag is, you know, Netflix were very disciplined about what code they put into this, you know, dynamic um, code loading. I've seen some companies basically put business logic into that as well. So when you deploy something, not only are you deploying a service, but you're deploying something into the gateway. And before you know it, you've got, you know, interactions between other services, multiple components to deploy. API gateway is awesome, but watch for loose coupling. Same with ESBs. The ESBs, in principle, I think were great, but we highly coupled ourselves to implementations. The vendors kind of, and I'm, my opinion, of course, the vendors got involved, I think, with ESBs too much. They tried to differentiate themselves, and it became an arms race, and you got locked in. 
Don't think people are doing that with API gateways. I think we're doing it ourselves, to be honest. So think about fundamental, you know, fundamental software architecture, loose coupling, high cohesion, separation of concerns, single responsibility. These are all fundamental patterns that really help you in microservices. Moving on, switching gears a little bit. So we're gonna look at the organizational side now. Um, I, I like to say, you know, greed, what's mine is mine within the organization. And microservices, bingo, I'm not gonna talk about it too much. Conway's law, everyone loves a bit of Conway's law, yeah? Um, but it's true, uh, I've seen, you know, and this is anecdotal evidence, but I've seen way too many systems to, to not realize that microservices and software in general, you know, it's about the people as much as it is about the tech, yeah? Maybe more, particularly in a migration from A to B. I don't care what A and B are, but things are gonna change. And change always brings loss, yeah? Loss of habits, loss of understanding, loss of responsibility, and as, a hu as humans, we're massively loss averse. That comes from Daniel Kahneman's book. But it, it's true, I don't like losing things. I, I, you know, I, I get nervous when things change, we all do, yeah? So we need to think about the organizational aspect of microservices. And many companies I work with, I think, eh, maybe ignore some of this thing. The class thing I was getting with Open Credo when, when I was working there was we, they bring, a company would ring us up and they say, we're stuck with this technology, we're stuck with microservices, and we're, like, we're more than happy to help you, no problems. We like to know a bit about your business, and we'd like to know a bit about your organization. You know, we're not trying to upsell, but we, just, we realize you know, we need to look at the holistic kind of thing going on, yeah? And we infrequently, towards like the last six months or so, we get a lot of pushback when we started talking about looking at the organization. It's like, no, no, don't worry. We've decided to reform our teams around squads, chapters, and guilds. We've got you covered, yeah? And when you walk in there, squads will be basically scrum teams, rebranded. Chapters will be tech leads. And a guild is, you know, we run a conference kind of once a month, something, yeah? Beware of cargo culting. I've heard it talked about already, yeah? Repeat three times, we are not Spotify. Yeah, um, Spotify are amazing, like the people there are amazing, but they've kind of, they've come to this culture and we're just trying to copy what we see, yeah. You need to think about things like the practices, the principles and the values as to why Spotify got to where they did. Now, Spotify, I know again, lucky enough with the InfoQ connections, I get to chat to these amazing people, which I'm, I'm very lucky. Uh, I was chatting to some Spotify people and they said to me, we optimize for autonomy and innovation. We as a streaming music company, if we can um, outperform or out-innovate our competitors, we make more money, yeah? So they, they, the reason they came to this like, design of organization was they're optimizing for autonomy and for um, innovation, yeah? Now, it's kind of dovetails nicely with Brian's talk this morning. If I'm building software for a nuclear reactor, the last two words I wanna hear in terms of values are autonomy and innovation, yeah? Makes sense, when you, when you say it that like bluntly, it makes, it makes really good sense, but I've seen it countless times, yeah. I'm sure I've even done a bit of this myself. As much as I'm talking about anti-fans, I've done them a few times as well. But think about these things. We need to understand, when you're copying tech, when you're copying organizational structure, whatever, when you're copying anything, think you're looking at the top of the iceberg, whole bunch of stuff below the sea, yeah. Need to look at the practices, principles, and values, and that, that's a much better way to understand how you should form your organization, how you should build your software. So sloth is the next sim, switching up. This is getting lazy with what I, well, we call them non-functional requirements, but I think they're, I like the term cross-functional requirements because I've seen many systems that were not functional due to non-functional requirements, yeah, these kind of things. So I like this quote a lot. Um, it comes from Aidan Casey on his blog, great blog post, and he says, that the driving technical requirements for a system should be identified early to ensure they are properly handled in the subsequent design, yeah, the driving technical requirements. Now, how often do you, you know, your, your client or your com yeah, boss or whoever your customer says to, you, says to you, build this, build this, build this. It's all functional stuff, yeah. And then you say, um, how fast should it be? Yeah, you're fast. Uh, should it be secure? Yeah. And you're like, what? What does that mean? Without me I think we as an industry are totally guilty as charged, yeah. We're a bit, um, we don't push back enough, yeah. We build systems from the functional point of view. We don't look at the non-functional. And as things are scaling more, this is becoming more and more of a problem, I, I think, as well. Um, so I've often seen projects, and again, I've been on a few of them, where the illities are an afterthought, the kind of availability, scalability, all this kind of good thing. Um, and the pushback I kind of get with this is that we're agile. And with agile, fam famous sort of Mary Poppins kind of quote, with agile, we delay decisions to the last responsible moment. I personally love the idea of the last responsible moment. It's the kind of moment where if you don't make a decision, it's gonna be irresponsible. Things are gonna go wrong. 
You don't want to make a decision here because you don't have all the data. You want to make it here when you've got the most data. It's the last responsible moment to make the decision. Otherwise, it's all going to fall apart. But the kind of news flash is sometimes with NFRs, this is actually up front. The last responsible moment is up front. Yeah? How are we going to scale? How are we going to do security? These things. And it can be costly, and I think prohibitive in some projects I've worked on, to adapt late in the project. And microservices, I don't think, you know, again, anecdotally, but I don't think makes it any easier. I, one project I worked on, we had to try and retrofit security into microservices. And no longer was it just retrofitting security into one thing. There's like 20 of the things now, and they'd all been built subtly differently. So, you know, be aware of these things. Really, really important. Hat tip to Sam here. I follow Sam's work, and I've known Sam for a while now. This thinking about security in particular is, I think, is going to catch up with us as an industry. Yeah, regardless of microservices, but in particular, microservices, people are getting a bit perhaps fast and loose with what they can do. Sam's done a great talk, uh, Velocity last year. Also, Aaron Gratifiori talked a lot about container security. And if you are working with containers, I highly recommend ch checking out Aaron's work. Um, even, like, a lot of um, container software, like Docker and so forth, out of the box, it kind of comes with some slightly funny config settings, partly from uh, historical reasons and you know, backwards compatibility, but like, using namespaces, those kind of things. So the combination, have a look at Sam's deck, have a look at Aaron's stuff if you're using containers. This will give you a great primer to think about the importance and how you might go about doing security within microservices. Yeah, I think it's really, really important. Lastly, we're at the point now where we can definitely test these things in the build pipeline. I mentioned I'm a huge advocate of continuous delivery. I think it's the single biggest thing I've done in many companies, or my team, I should say, you know, when I've worked with people. It, it really can be a game changer. There's many of other things you can, you can do as well, but once you've got this pipeline where you can put code in one end and it runs the gauntlet and gets tested and it pops out the other end, you know, either ready for production or in production, it's just fantastic. Technical people and business people alike go crazy when they see this. It's, just, it's, it's a really good feeling. We should be codifying these NFRs into the build pipeline. I'm a big fan of Gatling for, for testing at the moment. Gatling is a Scala-based tool. It's uh, you could, very easy DSL. Don't need to know Scala to, to write it. The beauty is you can write things saying Gatling, and then you can ship it off to flood.io. Now, now, Flood is a commercial service. I've got no interest in it in terms of commercial interest. Um, but it's an amazing service where you can run your Gatling scripts scaled up on Amazon. So we can put something into staging. We've been using it just to test locally, but now we can replicate the number of users and hammer our services to check they stand up. These things are really valuable. You should be able to use whatever you're using at, all the way through the pipeline. Ideally, you should be able to do what you're doing locally in development and then scale it as it goes through the pipeline. And Gatling and Flood.io flood is a great example of that. Security testing, thing, at least for me, are table stakes now. Like if, you're not, if you haven't got this stuff, go home. Or when you go back to the office, put it in straight away because it's super valuable. Things like the OWASP dependency check. Totally check out the OWASP website. I've learned a bunch of stuff about vulnerabilities from OWASP. But the OWASP dependency check is a language neutral kind of way of checking for critical vulnerabilities in your code. Uh, sorry, in your dependencies, I should say. So in the Java world, it uses um, it's a Maven plugin, and it looks for old versions that you're bringing into your code base that contain critical vulnerabilities. It does the same with pip. It does a bunch of stuff with RubyGems as well. So it's a real nice way to make sure you're not bringing in dependencies that, are, that have vulnerabilities. Yeah. And BDD security is a nice wrapper around uh, uh, the OWASP ZAP tool, which is an automated penetration testing tool. It doesn't replace penetration testers, but it's a very nice way to get the kind of basics of security in the pipeline. And then lastly, Docker Bench and Claire are for st their static vulnerability analysis scanners for Docker images. So if you're bringing in, say, Docker or Rocket or, or any kind of container technology, you typically run an OS within. So you've got your artifact, but now you're wrapping an OS around it. So you want to use things like Claire, which is open source, to do vulnerability analysis on that. You don't want to be running Heartbleed or Poodle, for example, in your container. Yeah, it's very easy to do that. Next is Wrath. It's blowing up when bad things happen. Previous talk, I talked a heck of a lot about um, the technical side. Yeah, uh, release it, fantastic book. If you haven't read it, it's, you know, it's pre-cloud, pre-microservices. But Michael, Michael Nygaard is one of those people that's often ahead of the curve. It's a fantastic book. Famously, this is the book that um, Adrian Cockroft gave to some people in Netflix. It was Ben Christensen and also um, Colton Andrus, two of the main engineers there. He gave them this book and said, we need to codify this stuff in our stack. And out popped the Simeon army. 
out popped Chaos Monkeys, yeah? So bulkheads, uh, retries, timeouts, all this kind of good stuff, circuit breakers, came from this book. So technical side of when stuff goes wrong, do read this stuff. I'm changing my thinking around some of these things, around putting more of the fault tolerance into the platform, into the service mesh, for example, but these are good primers. But today I'm gonna to talk about more of the people side of bad, when bad things happen. And when bad things do happen, people are always involved, yeah? I personally like to be this person, yeah? <laughs> Kicking back with a beer, cashing the consultant check, yeah? Um, no, in all seriousness, yeah, you, you know, you need to know what's going on. Um, how does DevOps fit all into this? You know, again, this is gonna be a skirt around DevOps because DevOps is a huge topic. Andrew did a great job on this stuff yesterday. But some resources I find really useful to help me understand about DevOps and shared responsibility, shared ownership, end-to-end -end delivery, these kind of things. Matthew Skelton, fellow Londoner, awesome guy like Gerber, a deep thinker again, he's, he's got some work called DevOps Topologies where he highlights in the red there anti-patterns of DevOps implementations. The kind of Dev, DevOps, Ops team, for example. He also highlights in the blue some good patterns around DevOps. It's, it's a really good resource of how to identify perhaps where you are as a company, as an organization, as a team, and where you want to move to to get the best out of what he believes you know, DevOps should be. And I subscribe to a lot of Matt, Matthew's theories. He's written some cool books and stuff as well. I do love books. So in the UK, before I, I've changed jobs, I used to have a long commute. So I used to read a lot of books on, on the commute. I, I travel quite a bit, I guess, as well. But these, for me, help me understand what DevOps is about. I love the um, SRE book. It's already been talked about quite a bit at this conference. Andrew talked about it yesterday. It's Google's way of doing DevOps. And again, don't cargo cult. Don't blindly copy what you see there, because I've seen that in a few companies as well. But the first three chapters of that book are amazing about just watching the evolution of how Google do DevOps, yeah? They, they solve things in a very interesting way. Um, and I've learned a bunch from that book, which I've sort of distilled and, and taken away. Keith's book is fantastic. I know Keith quite well. Um, always enjoy chatting to him. He's ahead of the curve when it comes to um, infrastructure. He's a thought worker. Um, that book won't make you an expert, say, in Terraform or Ansible, but it will give you the primer to understand how infrastructure as code fits into the big picture. And that's really important, I think, with uh, microservices. Unless you're putting onto a platform, you need to think about the platform. Uh, things like Effective DevOps cover, so Jennifer and Catherine did amazing work from Etsy, Catherine is, BeerOps on Twitter, she's a really good person to follow. They talk more about the people side, the cultural side, the hiring side of DevOps. Really helped me to think about this kind of shared ownership thing. And lastly, DevOps Handbook is a fantastic book if you're in an enterprise and looking to understand how to move to this new modality of working that we're calling DevOps now. So, there is a danger, I think, with the DevOps thing. One, one of the things I see when things are going wrong is there's this notion of hero or heroine kind of um, culture. The hero pops up. I'm a full stack DevOps engineer. And you see this quite a bit. In London, quite, we see it quite a bit, actually, of this one person offering they can solve all of your DevOps problems. And I was chatting to Charity Majors at a conference last year, and Charity runs Honeycomb, honeycomb.io. She had a very interesting sort of career. And she was trying, I think she was trying to hire for Honeycomb. And people were saying to her, yeah, I'm a full stack DevOps engineer. And she just got completely sick you know, of this. When she interviewed them, they were not full stack. They knew a couple of things. And she did this great quote at the talk at CraftConf last year. And she said, I'm sorry, but if you're not designing the computer chips and writing the website, then I don't want to hear from you as a full stack developer. Yeah. You know, Kevin Henney often talks about this. When people say they're full stack, he often asks them, how's your device driver writing code? Yeah, and everyone's like, well, I don't write device drivers. You're not full stack. It's, it's kind of been a bit flippant, but we can only do so much as an individual. Back when I started my career, full stack meant I knew JavaScript at the front end and Java at the back end. It then has expanded to knowing databases, and now it's got kind of crazy. I like to be a generalist, but I totally appreciate the need for specialists. I've worked with some amazing people in my career at Open Credo and many other companies as well, where I may be sort of looking at the overall thing, but I cannot do the work without people being specialized in certain things, yeah. Brian hinted at it this morning. Dev, DevOps, I love the idea of DevOps, but fundamentally, it is DevOps, yeah. There's different skill sets there. For me, this comes down to defining responsibilities. As, as the kind of anti-pattern, I've seen people building entire microservice platforms. Colin works at Pivotal. Very, Colin's a very opinionated person. I saw this tweet a few years ago. It's, it's always fun chatting to Colin. And he was seeing a lot of people building their own thing a few years ago. And guilty as charged, I had a go at those on a couple of projects as well. Do we really want to build an entire microservice platform, or should we as developers be focusing on the stuff that matters? Yeah, on the core stuff. And for me, this comes down to continuous integration, continuous delivery. Mechanical sympathy is understanding the fabric 
or the platform you're deploying onto in enough detail. So mechanical sympathy comes a lot from I love Formula One uh, motor racing. Um, so Jackie Stewart, very good driver, uh, he understood how an engine worked. He couldn't build an engine, as a, he was a driver, a really good driver, but he understood about torque ratios, power bands, all this kind of stuff. That made him a really good driver. He understood the one level deeper, oh, sorry, one level deeper. The engineers were the, you know, the geniuses doing all the work on the engine, but he understood. He had sympathy with the mechanics, yeah? I think we need to get sympathy as developers, as architects, with cloud, with containers because they do alter the way you deploy and run services. I've got a bunch of other talks you can look online where I've talked more about that kind of thing. Logging and monitoring, hopefully table stakes these days, super important, but do look at um, open source PaaS, FAS, DB, you know, DB as a service, I should say. I am seeing a lot more value in these things. You know, a lot of people want to run their own stuff, but I think the argument for running a pri private cloud is pretty thin unless you are a Google or some other company, or you have very strict regulatory requirements. I think you know, most people are getting into public cloud. And the next evolution of this, in my mind, is going to be an embrace of PaaS. Yeah? We've been flirting with it for a few years. And things like OpenShift, Deus, Cloud Foundry, and all the kind of serverless type stuff and databases as a service, you know, it changes the way you work. But there's a lot of benefits as a developer for cutting out some of the operational overhead. I let Amazon take care of that. I let Microsoft Azure take care of that. These kind of things. So one of the anti-patterns I see is people shooing this, going, I'm going to build my own platform. You always need a platform. What, if you're developing microservices, you always need a platform. Service discovery, um, scheduling, fault tolerance. You end up building yourself. And again, guilty as charged on that one. I did it a few years ago. We accidentally kind of built a platform. Switching up. So yeah, now looking a little bit at the data models, because like we talk a lot about RPC and all these other things, but architecture and data models is the fundamental stuff of what we do. As, as software developers, yeah. And a couple of anti-patterns I've seen, one is the shared single domain um, pattern, which uh, comes from Tarek Abadrabo, a, C a CEO of OpenCredo now. So I work with Tarek a lot, he's a deep thinker on this stuff, so I'll talk about that, and also the connection with data stores as well. So previously, we had one model to rule them all. Now that, was, that was good path, you know, good best practice, shall we say. I remember a few clients um, building, you know, spending months building what we called the canonical domain model. Yeah, getting the perfect representation of things in your business. But it took months, it took you know, a long time because it was really hard to do. When you've got the big enterprise, you can't all agree on what certain things look like. And I think this is another reason why microservices have become popular because you can model your domain depending on your interests. Yeah? So domain driven design, I won't talk too much about it, but it's well worth looking into. Um, the books are quite a deep read, to be honest, but there is a shorter book now, uh, the green book coming out, which summarizes a lot of these things. So a lot of the clients I work with, I say, you know, get sort of a primer, understand some of the key concepts behind domain-driven design, and, and the green book is a fantastic reference. Because a lot of these things, you know, it was written before microservices, I will say that. So. Um, a lot of the concepts don't gel perfectly with microservices, but they really help me as an architect, as a developer, understand about modeling. Because all software is modeling some aspect of the real world, yeah? You're coding, you're modeling the business, you're modeling something. And improving my modeling skills really helped me build software, to be honest, but definitely microservices, because we have different, you know, different models in different services. I found this really beneficial. And again, watch for, you know, it does break encapsulation, it does introduce coupling. The famous thing I did a few years ago was I um, shared an artifact with all my domain entities, thinking I was really clever, and like, I shared it with each service. The problem was it was a startup, and the domain was constantly changing. So every time the domain changed, I had to redeploy all the services, which was like, obviously, you know, completely daft from my point of view. So I've been there, I've done that. Don't, don't do that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry. Um, think about, you know, when you're analy analyzing your system, you're thinking about building microservices or you're doing a migration, you need to understand where you, where you are, situational awareness, but also where you're getting to as well. And two techniques I found really beneficial are context mapping, uh, and also that's classic domain-driven design stuff, and event storming. And again, I'm only just getting into event storming, but they model the static and the, um, and the dynamic systems so, sorry, I'll take, start again. They model the static and the dynamic properties of the system you're designing. It's really important to look at both aspects, yeah? The static in terms of bounded contexts, user service or account service, checkout service, these kind of things, but also how does the data, how does the business logic flow around kind of the, the system? These are two things that I found really helpful in my journey with microservices. 
The beauty of bringing out these kind of individual models and individual services is we can choose appropriate data store technology. Now, this is awesome, but a word of caution, you know, choose the right tool for the job. Relational databases are awesome. I use them, uh, like MySQL a lot, I use Postgres a lot, I use like the cloud versions of them typically. They're really valuable for structured data. No need to throw them out. No need to throw out the, you know, the baby with the bathwater, as they say. Cassandra is awesome, but I think many people misunderstood the stories coming from Netflix. They thought it was a faster, a more scalable version of a relational database. It's not, yeah, and I was seeing many problems, my team was seeing many problems at Open Credo, where people were having problems scaling Cassandra, thinking it was a technical issue, and it was actually a data modeling issue. They'd modeled the data as like it was a relational database, and Cassandra doesn't scale like that. So they were doing queries that would freeze the whole cluster, for example. So often technical and, and data modeling go hand in hand. Don't build graph databases, relational databases. I sort of did that once, my, my bad. Um, and again, I'll, I'll just reiterate, be aware that us as, if you're a developer, if you identify as a developer, it's very easy to spin up a Docker container with Cassandra, with uh, Redis, take your pick. Um, but there is operational overhead for running that in production. It sounds really obvious, but seriously, many times in projects I work on, there's some kind of Docker container running in production that's got stuff in, and it's, ah, you know, it's super fragile. Kind of like Brian was saying, it's like the tire fire waiting to explode, yeah? So think about the operational aspects as well. Um, so final sin, uh, hopefully coming out quite nicely on time, is pride, and I think testing changes a lot um, with microservices, because you're no longer poking one thing and something dropping out, you've got a distributed system, yeah? And QA, often get sort of marginalized. In my anecdotal experience, people forget about the QA stuff until the end of the project, and then, because it's microservices, it's all changed and the impact is massive. Previously, I talked a lot about um, local verification. Uh, I was quoting this, uh, Toby Clemson's awesome work from ThoughtWorks again. Um, so if, you, if you're just getting into microservices and testing, Toby's is, the, is a kind of canonical reference. Sam's book's a great primer on the overall thing. Toby's stuff is really good on the testing angle, yeah? So do check this out. I'm gonna go a bit um, deeper this afternoon on something I've, uh, partly with my work at Specto, so hands up, this is, it's all open source work I'm gonna be talking about, but it's partly with stuff I've done, or my team, I should say, have done in Specto. Um, but I really got into service virtualization over the last year. And that's what we sort of used to call it. We're, I think the industry's changing a little bit to API simulation or service simulation. But the idea being, it's sometimes quite tricky to develop against something that's either you know, another team's developing or isn't ready yet or it's a third party. You know, if you look on the diagram here, and I'll, I'll stand over on this side, um, you have a like, consumer, the producer may be unavailable. It may be expensive to run, but you're building something that is coupled to it. So you can actually put something in the middle, like it's basically, it, it, it's most, crudest form, it just records requests and responses at an RPC level. You can do messaging as well, but I won't cover that today. This is really valuable. I had a couple of projects where we worked on where we needed to interact with this third party system, but we could only use it once a month, and we couldn't generate deterministic failures. So we wanted to test how our system would handle these failures, but we couldn't, couldn't do it until we started using basically a proxy. Yeah, you put a proxy in the middle there, you can see, and it's kind of, kind of useful. When you scale it up, yeah, so say you've got many you know, microservices, many internal producers, you've got some maybe a PayPal or eBay third party system outside your boundary, this gets harder and harder. I've written an article about locally testing microservices. So if you search online locally testing microservices, I've shared my thoughts about that already. But this one way, and I'm not saying it is the de facto way, but one way is to virtualize those services. This comes typically a bit later in the pipeline. You might want to mock, say, up front, but virtualize later. And then you can do kind of funky things with these virtualized services, these API simulations, if you will. There's a kind of bunch of tools, um, classics, and you might have had these in your organization already. There's new stuff like Hoverfly, which I'm working on, open source, Wiremock, awesome guy Tom Akehurst in, in the UK, works on a Java sort of framework, uh, very similar. There's v VCR, Betamax, Mountie Bank from ThoughtWorks. Mirage is a Python-based one. So all the languages are covered, whatever you're, you're coding in. I'm gonna talk a little bit about Hoverfly, and um, this is open source, it's Go-based, super high performance. The reason we wrote it is we were struggling with some of the other tools that were not, and um, they were written in JVM languages and a bunch of other things, and they just weren't designed quite right, so we couldn't scale them. So now we've actually like, rewritten, rewritten this stuff in Go, super lightweight, single binary, and you can simulate many services from one binary, which is kinda cool. Kind of funky stuff, and again, this is, you know, whether you're using Wiremark, Hoverfly, whatever, you typically sort of, you know, you put your 
thing, hold fly in this case, in the middle between your client and your external service, and you record traffic. So when you're in simulate mode, you can get rid of the external service, and you can just put a request in, it matches, and it responds back. The cool thing is you can often with these things put middleware in the middle. So you can do stuff like remove credit card details or social security numbers, that kind of thing, yeah? And strip out data to record later, which is quite useful. And you can pipeline these things, classic Linux stuff as well. Um, the really funky thing comes in simulate mode where you can kind of use it to do fault tolerance. Yeah, you've, you've recorded your request and responses, but now we can reach into the, rec the recording of those, change the data, add delays, basically mess with the response, and in a deterministic fashion, you can codify how you want these services, uh, these fake services to act, and you can test that your system, your service, behaves appropriately. So Hotfly's got some Java, um, uh, JUnit support, um, like Java developer kind of the most stuff I do. You can spin up like rules like this. Um, you, it's all like a nice DSL kind of thing. Wiremock is identical in terms of style, so I'm, I'm showing you Hoverfly, but it's kind of very similar to many other things. You can actually put it straight into your testing. There's like a um, .NET version, there's Python, a bunch of other stuff as well. Um, but the, you can see the power. You can basically codify in your test harness. You can say, fake these services, fake these endpoints. It's a very powerful paradigm when you suddenly realize you, you can even spin up things that don't exist yet. Wiremock's got a great DSL for coding these things. Mirage, kind of the same. You can codify what you want to be there. And basically, if you're being blocked by some downstream service, you can get working by codifying these kind of rich mocks up front. You can do like fault tolerance stuff as well, which is quite, quite funky as well. But yes, let's wrap this up. I think we are coming pretty close to time. So this is what, um, what I've sort of seen as the seven more deadly sins, yeah? Um, do think, if you're gonna go to microservices, think, is it the right choice for you? Is it the right choice for your team? Is it the right choice for your organization? Think about technology, Docker, Go, Java. There's always a cost for bringing in new stuff, yeah? Think about communication, same kind of thing. I like service meshes, really liking reactive and events as well, but figure out what's right for you, yeah? You know, what your skill set of your team is, these kind of things. Think about the organizational aspect. It cannot be underemphasized in my, my experience. Um, and also think about things like getting lazy with NFRs from the you know, people and technical perspective as well. So, um, with RAF, exactly that. Think about when, when things blow up. Think about DevOps. I think you know, some notion of whatever you identify as DevOps has to be in place in your team to, to use microservices. You have to have end-to-end -end, end -end responsibility. You have to have shared ownership. Otherwise, microservices get out of hand very quickly, in my experience. Um, Envy, so yeah, think about the single domain model. Think about how you're backing those models with, with data stores and stuff. But don't get me wrong, many of the sins have been kind of around the edges. The fundamental stuff we're talking about with microservices is architecture and it's domain modeling, yeah? And it's static and it's dynamic. So think about those things and you won't go far wrong. I think we often get distracted with other things, but that's your fundamental stuff to think about. And testing does alter. One thing I found useful is this kind of notion of um, virtualizing services. And again, love to hear your feedback on that kind of stuff as well. Um, some books, I always got around Sam's book. I found it really useful on my genuine microservices. There's a couple other O'Reilly books in the same space. Total shout out to Susan Fowler. That is an awesome book, Production Ready Microservices. If you haven't read it, please do. It's a really nice kind of primer for running services. Um, Susan used to work at Uber. I'm sure a few of you may have heard the story, but now she's working at Stripe. Um, she's, got, she's got some amazing thinking around this stuff. A bunch of other ones, thinking about APIs, continuous delivery, all this kind of stuff. The slides will go, go online. I think some of them already are online. At that point, I shall say, don't forget to rate the talk. Really appreciate your feedback, both on the app and also in person or, or Twitter or something. But um, thank you very much for your time. <laughs>